welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 262nd episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today's episode is the episode I have promised for two weeks um, in the weekly newsletter that would be the episode. If you are a weekly newsletter subscriber, this newsletter arrives for free in your inbox every Friday with an update of everything that has been shared and posted on the blog so that if you don't want to have to check the blog every day, you will not miss a thing. And a couple of extra bonuses or that you get an exclusive post of inspiration to kick off the weekend, as well as a heads up on what the next week's podcast episode will be. And if we're in the middle of the cooking show season, which we are right now, you get to know what the upcoming episode will be on the cooking show. And last week, or should I say two weeks ago, I mentioned that I was going to be talking about the myths of the perfect life. And it's inspired by this new book written by Paul Dolan, best-selling author Paul Dolan, who is the author of Happy Ever After, Escaping the Myth of the Perfect Life. Well, it took me a little bit longer to read it because my week got busy. My month was kind of crazy, as you guys probably already know, but things are calming down. And I really wanted to pay the proper attention to this book because it aligns very well with the Simply Luxurious Life. It's about this idea of basically living consciously, critically thinking, asking questions about whether you're following or living a life because this is the way you want to live your life. And so I'm excited about today's episode. We're going to share nine ways to let go of the myth of a perfect life, entirely inspired by Paul Dolan's book. But before we get to that list, this week's Petit Plaisir is a twofer because, well, there was a great movie that premiered this weekend in um, the States. You probably probably already know what I'm talking about. And I will not give you, give you any spoilers. Don't worry if you haven't seen it. But I do want to share a few thoughts thoughts. Very positive. Don't worry. And there is a second uh, petit plaisir as well as we kick off the fall season here in the States because today is the first day of fall. But now let's get into the nine ways to let go of the myth of a perfect life. I want to begin with a quote from this book. When we learn how to spot the narratives that get in the way of our happiness, we improve our chances of taking control of the stories that have for so long controlled us. When I read this quote in the intro, I highlighted, I starred, I reread it because I agree with this. And I've written about this for the past nearly 10 years on the Simply Luxurious Life. I have spoken and written about the idea of living a conscious life by being aware of where your influences come from and whether or not you are sincerely thinking for yourself or not. Because initially we may think we are thinking for ourselves. But sometimes we dig a little deeper and we realize, whoa, I'm creating a life so that other people will applaud. Because when we get into different ways of living, we actually achieve what we think we want. If we are achieving it or pursuing it because of what society says we should and we get there and it isn't what we think, it's often because we haven't been truly following what is speaking to us. Instead, we have been following what other people are suggesting or nudging or telling or dictating we should do. So I was very excited about this book. It is one to read with an open mind. And I will share nine ways that he suggests to examine or nine areas he suggests to examine. And he shares these different areas in a very organized way that's very formulaic for each section. So once you get the the feel of the first chapter, you're going to know how he's going to approach every subject after that, which is quite helpful with regards to all the information you're gathering. He's sharing a ton of research and it's a, it's a slow read because you want to digest it, but it's worth reading. And there were times I had to put it down because I was like, wait a second, what's he going to say about monogamy? What's he going to say about cheating? But then I read the chapter and I didn't have to be so scared. Because all he's asking for is us to 
think consciously, to live in a way that isn't blind. Everyone's still going to choose a unique path for themselves. There may be some narratives that for others, it's a narrative script that they're following blindly. But for others, it's no, it's who they sincerely are. They, they've, they've been living consciously. This is something that really fits with who they are and how they want to live. And it's awesome for them. But for others, it would be following. So I think if we read this book as objectively as we can, we can get a lot out of it. And everyone will get something different out of it. So here is another quote from the book before we get into the list. There are countless stories about how we ought to live our lives. As such, many of these stories end up creating a kind of social dissonance, whereby perversely, they cause more harm than good. They become narrative traps, which together form the myth of the perfect life. With that, let's get into the nine ways to let go of the myth of a perfect life. Number one, understand the difference between having wealth and being rich. Wealth is defined as accumulated assets in the form of savings, investment, and property, and is much more difficult to measure. Rich is often understood to be a numerical amount of cash earned in income. So looking at one's wealth is a better reflection of a person's purchasing power. In other words, simply because someone looks rich, we may know their number that they're receiving in salary. This does not mean they actually are. And this is less about examining others because comparing is not healthy, as we'll talk about in a minute, and more about looking at our own lives. And instead of pursuing the image of rich, instead creating a life that is truly wealthy so that we are financially secure. And it may not look that way to the outside. We've talked about this many times on this podcast and the blog and in my books, but it's about being truly wealthy and secure so that you can live well. And when you are able to contribute to society, that's number one. I want to leave you with a quote with regards to number one from the book, getting richer does not necessarily bring more happiness, partly because we upwardly adjust the people we compare ourselves to. There's a lot of different reasons this happens, but it's part of living a life unconsciously. And it's also with regards to this idea of we upwardly adjust. Not only do we upwardly adjust with who we compare ourselves to, we upwardly adjust with what we, because we're comparing we upwardly adjust with regards to what we feel we have to do or have to have. And so if we're living consciously, we can potentially avoid this air and truly remain wealthy without extending ourselves too far. So that's number one. Number two, a happy life doesn't require you to have children. I'm just going to read a quote from the book because the key with this book and with this episode highlighting the book is that Everyone will make different choices. The key is to make sure you're living your life. Make sure you're living consciously because it fits you. There are people that want and love and are amazing parents, but that's not for everyone. And on the flip side, if someone doesn't have kids, they may sincerely and deeply want them and not be able to have them for whatever reason. The key is to make sure you're clear about what is speaking to you and you're choosing or finding the courage to live that life to the best of your ability. So here's a quote from the book. He says it far better than I could. Happy and fulfilled lives are often supported by, but certainly do not require children. There are good reasons not to have children, both at the micro and macro level. It is not helpful, therefore, to push the have your own kids narrative on everyone. Finding a way to celebrate rather than undermine people's decisions to remain child free by loosening our hold on the social narrative can have a positive societal impact. I personally appreciate immensely that he used the term child free instead of childless. Why? Because words are powerful. And when you talk about someone's choice, by saying it in a derogatory way, you are inflicting an opinion. Now, we have to be careful based on the audience or the person we're speaking with. But for me to say that was my choice, I would choose the word child free. If someone's speaking to me and they say childless, there's judgment there. 
But if someone were to speak to me and say child free about me, I appreciate their thoughtfulness. If someone wants children, it's understandable why they may use the word childless because they want them. So context is very powerful. Knowing the words we choose have power and using it for good and for a positive contribution to whatever situation we're in makes a difference. So I want to thank the author for using that term. That's number two. A happy life doesn't require you to have children. Number three, stop comparing yourself to others and putting yourself in a position to be tempted to compare. Nolan suggests if you are going to make comparisons, to make a comparison to any one of the other 7 billion people on our planet, most likely, I mean, if you're tuning in this podcast, you have the means to do that. You have the technology to do that, the time to do that. Most likely you are doing very well financially. Not only will this provide perspective, but also humility. So even if right here in this moment, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I wish I could, or if only this was paid off, or if only this was how ha- I've been there, I am there at different times. Stop for a moment. If you're going to compare yourself, follow his advice, and maybe this would just shift your attitude to a more positive space so that when you do step forward toward whatever dream or goal you're working for, you can be focused on that positive and be appreciative for what you have because that's what's going to create more of what you want rather than more of what you do not want. So I think this is something that's very powerful. And the power of comparison, positive or negative, is amazing. So consider and try to be more conscious of what is going on when you compare. Personally, as I've written about before, the best person to compare yourself to is who you were yesterday. Are you doing better? Are you you using your mind in a more positive way? Are you growing in some way, no matter how small? That's the person that you should be comparing yourself to. Number four, let go of the pursuit for more money. Once you have enough money to live a life in which you are not struggling for the basic necessities, Nolan suggests taking the path to just enough. Why? When we become aware of what we truly need, we are demonstrating, we are cognizant of the social comparisons and status markers that may have pushed us to pursue more in the past. Understanding why we are pursuing what we are pursuing to truly get to the core of this urge is to make sure we are indeed thinking for ourselves and not being unconsciously led around by the nose due to the narrative traps we are unaware surround us constantly. Once you stop pursuing more money, quote, you can stop constantly worrying. And what a gift to give yourself as your every days will elevate immediately. Oh, isn't that true? Even if it's been just a moment that you've experienced this, the, the, the not having to worry is is a huge lifting of a burden. And whether we realize it or not, when we choose to worry with regards to wanting more, even though we're doing okay, after, remember, we talked about the whole comparison thing and who we should actually be comparing ourselves to, that eliminates a lot of stress. And when we're not stressed, we have, we are living more healthily. We are able to think more clearly. We are not expending energy unnecessarily and our lives improve exponentially. So that's number four. Number five, re-examine what your success looks like and let go of the pursuit for status. Conscious living is at the heart of what we're talking about today and becoming clear about what we are pursuing and what is pushing us to achieve it is crucial to live a more contented life. If at the core of why you are pursuing a particular career is because of the status it will bring, the pl- the applause you imagine will happen, then you are being led around by a narrative trap. However, if you are instead pursuing a field of study that ignites you, allows you to come to life and aligns with talents that naturally are easy to share with the world, then you are on the right path for the success that will be unique to you. Now, we still have a lot more to talk about. I have four more myths to let go of when it comes to talking or trying to live this idea of a perfect life. And I'll get to them as soon as I introduce you to this week's sponsors. Did you know it takes 20 tons of earth mining to produce a single ring of gold? That's why brands refuse to tell you where their gold comes from. Not at Ana Luisa. 
Anna Luisa uses 100% recycled gold in their products. Big brands will charge you 10 times the cost of production. Anna Luisa eliminates the retail markup, keeping the prices as fair and as accessible as possible. Having had the opportunity to wear Anna Luisa's jewelry, I can attest they are just as lovely and just as wonderful as products 10 times the price. I have worn their simple gold necklace with for my everyday shirt dress that I wear to work with my striped button up collared shirt and jeans to go do my errands. And it just adds a subtle touch of something without going overboard. I absolutely love them. And as a simple, sophisticated listener, you have the opportunity to take 10% off your next order. Simply go to analuisa.com slash simple sophisticate and enter the promo code sophisticate 10 to receive 10% off your order. Again, that's analuisa, A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A.com slash simple sophisticate and enter sophisticate 10 to receive 10% off your order. Our teeth get older as we get older. And if you want to get your teeth fixed, the last thing you want to do is wear braces. And that's where Candid comes to give you the clear alternative to braces. Candid has an experienced orthodontist who is licensed at your state to create a treatment plan for you. They create a 3D preview of how your teeth will look after your treatments are done. And once you approve your 3D preview, Candid creates custom clear aligners that will be sent directly to you. There's no hassle of going to an orthodontist office and Candid costs $60. 65% less than braces. And for every aligner purchased, Candid donates $25 to Smile Train, who brings safe, 100% free cleft lip and palate treatment to children around the globe. As a simple, sophisticated listener, you have the opportunity to get straighter, brighter teeth in an average of just six months. Learn more at candidco.com slash simple and use the promo code simple to get $75 off your purchase. That's candidco, C-A-N-D-I-D-C-O dot com slash simple and enter the promo code simple for $75 off your order. Welcome back. Let's get to our sixth myth to let go of when it comes to the myth of a perfect life. Pursue a career in which many skills are utilized and your contributions are valued. So this myth that we have to pursue a career that, again, molds with what we were talking about in point five, um, where the masses will applaud, where we will ret- attain this particular status because of what society approves of, is misguided. Dolan found that those individuals who actually work on a job that uses a variety of skills are the happiest. As well, if your work is valued, that too will cultivate a work environment of enjoyment. When we talk about a value, meaning you're contributing, it may not go down as the big applause. It may not go down as a status symbol, but people who recognize what you're really doing, the effort you are putting in, the the skills you are utilizing, that is something that society needs. That is a job of value. Not only is a job that asks our minds and sometimes bodies to work different skill sets and tasks healthy, regular exercise for our brains and beings, but it leads to a feeling of productivity at the end of the day, which is very satisfying. Add the knowledge that what we are doing is contributing something of value that we are proud of to the society that we wish to be a part of. That is a pair that is perfect natural medicine for a sound and peaceful night of rest. So that's number six. When it comes to pursuing a career or trying to cultivate a career that we will sincerely feel good in, think about seeking out one that asks to utilize many different skills and is of value. Number seven, and has to do with women and girls and education. Nolan found that receiving a basic education for girls had a significant effect on the overall happiness of their lives. In other words, making sure all people, but especially girls, enables them to have agency over their own lives. Largely because the world is dominated by patriarchies, educating women to understand the world they live in and how to advocate for their own rights, as well as navigate in the world that may not, depending upon where they live, want them to think for themselves is crucial for the individual's happiness. So he talks about in an an entire chapter, the value of education when it comes to happiness. And while it was small, he points out, it is still very significant for everybody, no matter your sex, but it especially was strong and significant for girls. Number eight, 
understand the difference between passionate and companionate companionate love. So here's a quote from the book. And when I say companionate, he is describing this as, well, it's companion and then at ATE, this concept of enjoying someone's company. Here's a quote from the book. Given the way that love is portrayed in literature, film, and the media, the prevailing narrative clearly places a high premium on its passionate aspect, most often in manipulatively uplifting ways. As shared previously on The Simply Luxurious Life, being married is not the causation of happiness, but rather, if the happiness lasts beyond the short term, as it does bring a feeling of euphoria to have met society's standard or expectation in the short term, it is due to two happy people finding each other. In other words, they knew how to be happy on their own, and the happiness together, being happy in their choice to come together, likely increased their feelings of contentment. Nolan points these findings out as well. When it comes to falling for the trap of passionate love and trying to mold it into happily ever after, I too have fallen into that narrative trap as well. The narrative of intense chemistry swirls around us constantly in the media as something we must pursue and seek out in our long-term relationships. And it is up to us to be aware of what is and what would be best for the long-term relationship we are seeking if we want to be healthy and be loving with with respect. This is not to say we can't have those passionate relationships, but we have to be cognizant that that, if that's the only thing that's holding us together, is not the ingredient that will hold us together in a healthy, respectful fashion. So I think it is in the modeling and teaching and recognizing of what's being perpetuated in media often and sometimes in our own lives with other people in our in our lives that we are around what a real deep sincere love for another person what it really does involve so I think this for me I wish I would have read it a lot sooner I, I've known this before I read the book as I've written about in the blog but it wasn't until my late 20s early 30s that I accepted it and found it to be true so that's number eight Number nine, be married, be single. It does not matter when it comes to happiness. More and more studies are revealing that those who are married and happy are no more happy than any other group, whether you be single, widowed, or divorced. The social narrative of promoting marriage as the goal is prevalent in our society and has been for decades in our modern lives. In previous centuries, due to lack of equality laws, it was often a necessity to be married, especially for women. But when we look at our modern culture, we look at the 21st century, it's an entirely different story, and thus we need to be living consciously. When we can recognize the narrative trap, we need to be clear about what is speaking to us for how we wish to live our lives. When we do this, we set ourselves free to live our best lives, whether that is with or without someone. Number nine is one I've talked about quite a bit on this, on the blog and the podcast. There are amazing relationships out there. There are amazingly happy people in relationships but there are also amazingly happy people that are not in relationships. And I think it's that recognition and honoring of that truth that will enable people not to feel that they should seek out a relationship when they're either not ready or don't want one. Um, and we need to be supportive of that, not only in ourselves, but with others. Nolan's book continues to explore many other topics such as myths when it comes to health, um, volition, monogamy, and altruism. And I highly encourage you to read it as it provides an exercise for the brain, as I mentioned at the top of this episode, regarding the narrative traps we may have stepped into and did not realize. To make a blanket statement and say that all social narratives are bad is not wise, but all should be explored. And likely, at least for me, you may find that most should be challenged. That is the difficult part, as you are going against the grain of what society expects. Dolan reminds that any narrative that is predominant, quote, always serves the interests of those in power. The groups they serve best will depend on the context, end quote. What he is suggesting we keep in mind whenever we talk about or consider and examine any narrative is to closely look at the narrative itself to understand all the nuances and not make sweeping assumptions or statements. 
I often tell my students, most issues are not just black and white. There's a lot of gray. And for us to jump to one side immediately without examination is to be the fool. So it's important that we step back, ask questions, take our time, and often, especially when it comes to ourselves, but also when it comes to others and suggesting we would know what's best for them, that's a fool's pursuit. We can only manage and navigate our own way, and we need to make sure we're living consciously. Fundamentally, when we let go of what no longer serves us, we set ourselves free. And much like the season of fall or autumn, and as the quote I'm about to share below reminds, it is a lovely revealing of what we have the opportunity to experience as we go about living a life that will bring us far more contentment than we ever expected. Here is a quote from Emily Lee, A Simplified Life. Trees are about ready to show us how lovely it is to let things go. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I have a few more links of episodes and posts you might enjoy on this topic. So feel free to visit the show notes to simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 262. And I'll be right back with this week's Petit Plaisir. This week's Petit Plaisir is a twofer, as I mentioned at the top of the show. And the first one, I mean, it's fall after all, right? Today is fall or spring if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. And this weekend, I was playing with my pumpkins and or playing with pumpkins, I should say. (laughs) And that is my idea for this fall season. I was flipping through the most recent issue of Victoria Magazine. And as I shared on my Instagram stories, this last week, there were a few images that caught my eye. And one was stacking four um, cylindric kind of uh, pumpkins, one on top of the other, one gradually being smaller as it went up higher and higher and different colors as well. And as I went to one of my favorite grocery stores on Friday, I saw they just got a delivery of pumpkins and they were all different colors, sizes and shapes. And of course, I thought, what better way to start the weekend than beginning to decorate the home to look like fall. And while I don't go all out with my decorations, I'm pretty simple in what I decorate with and how I decorate. Pumpkins are always something I decorate with. And so I went and I splurged and I got four pumpkins, all for a total of, I think, $50. But I knew that that was all I would spend on seasonal decorations. And um, anyway, I shared a pic with it, a pic of this on my Instagram stories, and I'll share that picture on today's show notes if you want to take a look. Norman is sitting proudly next to the stack of pumpkins on my front porch. <laughs> it's simple, but it definitely lets the neighborhood know it's fall. And when I walk up my steps, it's fall. And, you know, fall is a lovely season for all the reasons we talked about today, the letting go and the revealing of what can be And it really can be beautiful. So that's this week's first Petit Plaisir. The second Petit Plaisir is, of course, the Downton Abbey film. I had the opportunity to go to a matinee this past weekend. And I will not share any spoilers. Don't worry. It was about a two-hour film. It's set in 1927. As we all know, the king and the queen, King George V and Queen Mary, are arriving for a special visit. And it's entirely about this weekend um, of their visit. But Every single character has some kind of storyline. And of course, they have to get everyone into the storyline. So no no one has a long storyline um, as we're used to in the PBS series. But I felt like Julian Fellows did a very nice job of presenting a storyline that was engaging um, and uplifting, but also sincerely opens the door very wide for a second film should the ticket sales be strong enough. And I do, I sincerely do think uh, um, the Dowager will be back next season. For those of you that have seen the film, you know why I'm saying that. I do think she'll be back. There's every character set the stage for something in the next film. Um, Branson, his story is going to be probably the focus based on what I could tell, but every single character had some kind of event or something that will happen in the next film should it happen. So if we want to make it happen, we need to go see the film again, which I might be doing. I, it, it's, it's something I want to go see again. As soon as I left the theater, I played the soundtrack for the film. It was fantastic. Of course, it's very similar to the original from the TV series, but um, beautiful video videography, but everything that we loved about the the series and 
just bravo cast bravo cast and if you haven't had the chance to see it you will not be disappointed I loved being in the theater this weekend because uh, most of the people in that theater had seen the entire six seasons and um, we all laughed and cheered and here's the other thing if you haven't gone and seen it yet some of the best moments are not a word not a word is said but it's just a look on the character's face and if you're in the theater with people who know the series, there will be a burst of laughter or appreciation because we know these characters. And I think that's the beauty of this film is there's a lot of depth that is understood already by the audience. So go enjoy and perhaps you'll be like me and go enjoy again. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir or Plaisirs, <laughs> where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Before I wrap up this week, um, if you haven't already stopped by the, the blog or tuned into the podcast, the third episode just aired and I made the classic French recipe to start off the fall season, apple tart tartan. And I showed you how to polish copper and it is so simple. Next week, I'm excited to share with you another classic French sauce that is often intimidating just by thinking about it, but it's so, so simple. I hope that when you see how easy it is, you'll be like, oh, I can do that. And you'll be adding immense amount of flavor to upcoming dishes that you wish to serve. Be sure to check out the Simply Luxurious Kitchen with brand new episodes airing each Saturday through September and October. Thank you for tuning in today. Wishing you a wonderful start to the new season. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up my new book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, Making Your Every Day's Extraordinary and Discovering Your Best Self. You can also pick up my first book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide, which is available now in paperback, ebook, and audio versions on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes, or wherever books are sold. To stay caught up on the most recent episodes of the podcast, blog posts, my new cooking show, and receive exclusive news as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your weekend, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox each Friday to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or a morning cup of coffee. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.